16, 17, 18, okay? So everyone, I, I realize that people are probably still finishing up their lunch. Um, we're going to freestyle it a little bit because we're running a wee bit behind, so we're going to try to catch up. So um, thank you for your patience. Um, and I also invite everyone to, to join me in wel welcoming our webcast viewers. I'm not sure, oh, over there. I'll look at, hello, webcast viewers. <laughs> My name is Willa Black, director of the Canadian Club of Toronto, and your host and viewers, thank you for being with us. Our club celebrates diversity in all its forms, and this is reflected not only in the wide variety of topics and issues that we addressed, but in the diversity of our speakers. And, and I think today's uh, event is a wonderful example of that. We wouldn't be able to offer such high quality programming without the support of our event sponsors. And today we're grateful for the support of Cisco, um, who made this happen. And I can tell you from personal experience that Cisco Canada has a very strong CSR focus on indigenous partnerships for community capacity building. And we're very, very pleased to be supporting this discussion today. And now it's time to hear from our special guests. Our future as a nation looks bright. Young leaders like the three that you're about to hear from today are passionate and engaged on issues that matter to us all, whether it be education, arts, culture, youth engagement, or reconciliation. Elijah Williams manages the Center for Indigenous Learning and Support at Sheraton, Hodgson Center. He also serves on the college's Indigenous Education Council. I'd now like to introduce Gabrielle Fayon. Gabrielle is the co-founder and co-CEO of the youth-led, youth-driven nonprofit organization called Assembly of Seven Generations. She's also the recipient of the 2015 Inspire Award for Youth, Métis. Tamara Takpani in the blue. Tamara is a Carleton University student pursuing a combined honors degree in psychology and Indigenous studies. She also works part-time at the Federal Department of Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs to advance Inuit issues in the public service. And our discussion today is moderated by Roberta Jameson. Roberta is a first lady in the truest sense of the word, the first, first, the first, first Nations woman in Canada to earn a law degree, the first woman ombudsman of Ontario, and the first woman elected chief of the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. As president and CEO of Inspire, this officer of the Order of Canada and multiple award winner is a tireless champion for Indigenous advocacy and education. Under Roberta's leadership, Inspire has flourished. She has led fundraising for annual disbur disbursements of bursaries and scholarships, raising tens of millions of dollars, supporting Indigenous students' post-secondary education and training. We're so pleased to have you with us, Roberta. Thank you. Audience, don't forget, if you have a question for our panel, please use the Q&A cards at your table, and volunteers will be walking around the room to collect them. And I am pleased now to turn the Canadian Club of Toronto's podium over to Ms. Jameson and to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Willa, and uh, first let me acknowledge and thank Senyawa Goa to Chief Stacy Laforme for welcoming us to the territory and bringing our minds together. I appreciate very much, Willa, that uh, you along with Cisco are sponsoring this event. We couldn't have it without you and the Canadian Club in particular always been an important forum and a great champion for enabling voices across the country to speak. I, um, we have an amazing panel, all compelling role models. And it is great to see and hear from them as Canada is shaping a future that will embrace First Nations, Inuit, and Métis as never before fastest growing demographic group with a great deal to offer the country. Not without challenge, we're on a journey. Reconciliation is a journey. And we read about the challenges every day in the newspaper from clean water, to land issues, to economic development, to health crises, and so on. But we know there can be a different future. 
and we know education is the key to that future, both education of Canadians about Indigenous peoples and education of Indigenous peoples in a way that acknowledges who we are. That education has to be accessible and it has to be meaningful, and to be meaningful, it needs to reflect our people. I'm going to ask a series of questions of, of the panelists, and then we're going to take your questions. So, first, I'm going to ask each of the panelists, I'm going to start Gabrielle and work down. Uh, what are the biggest challenges, what were the biggest challenges for you uh, during your education journey? What worked? What didn't? Um, so, Ani Bojo Tanchek Yuao. Um, my name is Gabrielle Fayance. I'm originally from Alberta. My family comes from one of the eight land based Metis settlements called Fishing Lake. And uh, I've been living in Ottawa on traditional Algonquin territory for, for a good portion of my life, in, the teen, in my teen years as well in my 20s. Um, and it was really hard living in Ottawa. So a lot of people think of Ottawa as the nation's capital and um, a lot of nine to five operations go on. However, there is indigenous people in Ottawa that don't benefit from those same privileges. And uh, so I lived in severe poverty in Ottawa growing up. And one of the biggest challenges with my education was, was getting to post-secondary. Um, so there wasn't enough support for me during high school. Um, and then, but I was eventually accepted into university in uh, an alternative program. And so I really support whenever I see alternative programs. Uh, so it was at Carleton University, it was called the Aboriginal Enriched Support Program. And that helped me out 100%. Um, but at the same time in post-secondary, there is um, and we were just talking about it earlier at our table, there isn't enough focus on retention. So even though I got into post-secondary, I still had struggles. Um, I still had to use the food bank. I still struggled to pay my rent while I was going to school. Um, so those are some of the challenges. Uh, but people actually believing that I could do that work and go to school, I think was one of uh, my biggest success stories. Thanks, Gabrielle. Elijah, how would you respond to that question? For me, um, I see it as there's a lot of ongoing challenges, um, and especially in my own experience of education, which started on Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve through the federal education system. So you have to fight through all the odds that are stacked up against you before you even get to post I before you even start to apply to college or university because I looked at the graduation rates for my year, 24% of Indigenous students on reserve graduated high school at the time. So those are, numbers are not good. You have a more, you are more likely to end up in prison than actually graduate high school. Then the chances of you going to post-secondary are even lower. Chances of you completing post-secondary are even lower. And then it goes so on, on and on. But for me, through my experience of education, I'm going to Sheridan, was really a transformational, I think, experience for my own self in terms of building my capacity as a leader in terms of my viewpoint. The program taught us a lot at Sheridan in terms of thinking critical, because um, I did photography, so it was really focused on a, thinking outside of this lens. So how do you use yourself as your identity in, in a way and fuse that into what you do? So the challenges I had while I was at Sheridan was there's times where you just want to quit and kind of give up. And you're at a place where it's foreign to you. Um, you don't know any other indigenous people, and so you feel alone. And then, but you have to, for me, I had to keep reminding myself of why I was doing it, despite any kind of challenges that were presented. But I keep reminding myself, because throughout my time in my undergrad, there's times where I just said, I, I can't do it anymore. I'm just going to give up. There's too much pressure. but. I have reminded myself of why I was here, of the support that my parents gave me, and also representing almost, you feel like you represent your community in a way. So for me, it was reaching out to some mentors and figuring, figuring out, reaching out to faculty as well. So those are the challenges I think a lot of Indigenous students face, including myself. I'm in my master's program right now, but it really is these barriers that are stacked up against you, and then you have to 
fight extra hard to get there, and then you're also fighting extra hard to stay there in college. So I think those things have to be talked about, um, and the retention, as Gabrielle said, is really important a narrative. Thanks, Elijah. Tamara, what were the biggest challenges for you during your education, and what worked and what didn't? So I'm an urban Enoch, and I am a young single parent. I had my son when I was 17 years old, and so I restarted high school from the beginning after he was born. I raised him for the first year, and then I went back and I did my 30 credits, my community service hours, my co-op placement all in two years with an honors um, A plus student. And then I decided I needed to go to post-secondary, but growing up, you don't think you're gonna make it to that point. You don't think that as a young indigenous person. And so it was really amazing. I started at Nunavut Sivunik a college program where you learn about um, the territory that was created because of our land claim and the 20 years of negotiations that Inuit fought the government to, to achieve. And um, from there, I went to Carleton University. I'm still there. I'm in my third year doing two degrees. And so I think um, one of my biggest challenges is that one of them is a very Western science-based degree. In psychology, we learn that uh, if it's not scientific, then it's not true. Um, but then I take courses at the same time for my second degree, which is Indigenous Studies. And there you just learn strictly about our ancestors and the knowledge that they have about the land and the environment. And so they're constantly fighting each other all of the time. And, and uh, the second most biggest challenge that I have is raising my son on my own to make sure that he's a good, strong Indigenous boy and he's proud of his culture. Um, so we keep really involved with the Ottawa Inuit Children's Centre where I'm vice president of their board. And so I think it's very important to stay connected to your culture, even if you're in an urban setting. And uh, you just got to keep pushing through. That's, that's a very important point. Let's stay with that. And I want to go back to Elijah and ask you what role your own identity, I know you're a proud Cayuga man, <laughs> What, what role has your own identity and grounding as a Cayuga person played in your journey thus far? So for me, um, before I went to college, before I went to Sheridan College to do photography, my dad told me before I left, he said, never forget who you are and where you come from. So to me, that message has stayed with me since then, is to not forget who I am as a, a, a Cayuga, a part of the Cuyahoga Nation, a Haudenosaunee, and also never forget where I come from, coming from Six Nations. So that stayed with me, and I think that grounding helped me through those difficult times of feeling like you want to give up, feeling like you want to quit. But also I think in terms of just that knowledge that is there in our own people of to think about the seventh generation, think about the faces that have, still, that have yet to come. So it was, to me, I always thought back to that. I never forget that point. And, and I think for me, I was cult culturally privileged in that sense of my father um, kept the knowledge in our house. We go to ceremony all the time. He encourages that. But what I wasn't privileged in a sense of where we grew up kind of thing, growing up on reserve, you don't have much. But my parents, what they did, they fostered an environment that encouraged us to be proud of who we are as, as Indigenous people, as Haudenosaunee. And to me, I always think back to that and I think at Sheridan, it, what Sheridan did for me in a way was open doors. But what got through me, what pushed me through the door was the, my culture to kind of ground me because it is scary to go through a door that you don't know what kind of outcome is going to be. You don't know what opportunities. Um, you don't, for me, I never even thought of myself of even doing a job like this. If you told me in my first year that I would be managing our Indigenous Center at the college, I wouldn't believe it. So for me, Sheridan had opened the door, but my culture pushed me through the door so I could have that strength to kind of continue on and also to inspire other youth because my goal coming into post-secondary was to always inspire other youth so that they know that they can, they can do it because I see so much talent out there. So many young people that have a voice, that have a perspective, that have a lived experience, I think that it should be told and we need to hear more stories. So important, Elijah, thank you. I'm gonna go back to Gabrielle now and. I'm getting some questions also from the audience, so I'll mix this up a bit. But non-Indigenous Canadians are learning more and more about our people. 
and they want to know where to put their efforts to create change. If you could say to non-Indigenous Canadians, man, many are tuning in on the webcast, what is one area that they could invest in, either financially or with their time, to help move Indigenous youth on the path to leadership so that our people can take our rightful place in the country? What would you say to them? So in 2017, I was appointed as a special youth advisor to Minister Bennett. And uh, at that time, we focused on TRC 66. So TRC 66 talks about multi-year funding for grassroots youth programming and building a network of best practices. Um, so we created the roadmap on the implementation of TRC 66. In the implementation, we had two requirements. One is uh, the establishment of Indigenous youth voices, and the second is building a national youth fund. So right now, there isn't a national youth funding program, um, but I know from my story that the reason why I got to where I'm at today was because of community. Um, so th what that means is peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Um, that means young people taking care of each other, young people connecting with elders, connecting with mentors. Um, and so that's what I do on the ground. I do that work on the ground. However, I do that work as a volunteer. So I'm literally picking up the pieces that, rec that residential schools left behind, but they're falling on our shoulders on the shoulders of indigenous young people. And it's just, it's not fair. Um, so that's what I would say to all of you is, please read our roadmap and support grassroots initiatives that are led by indigenous youth. Um, that to me is, instead of investing in, in uh, reactive services such as you know, hospitalization, incarceration, let's invest in the prevention of our young people of staying in school, of feeling successful, of healing themselves and their communities. Thank you, Gabrielle. You mentioned TRC. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And it's online. Uh, now Senator Marie Sinclair was the, the chief commissioner, so have a look at that report. It is more than ever relevant. And of course, it was focused on reconciliation at first truth and then reconciliation. And I want to ask Tam uh, Tamara because uh, another area that I think uh, many non Indigenous Canadians don't know about is the realities in the North. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you to talk to us about reconciliation. What does it mean to you? And what does it mean? Is it different in the North than the rest of Canada? Should we be looking at it differently? I think if we need to understand what reconciliation looks like, we need to know why we need to reconcile. And if you look back into the history, Inuit were the last Indigenous group who were colonized. And uh, we were left alone for a long time because there was no interest in the Arctic. And uh, as soon as the United States and Russia um, saw the land, they're like, oh no, these people are Canadian. They relocated us to the high Arctic and they said, you are our human flagpoles. And so we are gonna live up here. And um, so there's a long list of things that Inuit people have gone through much later than uh, First Nations and Métis. And so it's very fresh in our blood and our living ancestors today who went through these relocations, the residential schools. And so in order to reconcile, I think you need to step back and look at all of the policies. It goes back to policy. And uh, the way that we are today is because of how they treated my grandparents and my mother. And then in turn, it's, it's made it so that, like Gabrielle was saying, the youth have to uphold the communities and they have to be the strong ones so that uh, we can stop the cycle of abuse. And um, so reconciliation for Inuit looks like going back uh, to the policies and changing them so that our young people can be strong and they can uphold jobs and bring our community to be a healthy place. 
um, for our children and our grandchildren. And, and just staying with reconciliation, what are Canadians getting wrong? About, somebody asked this in the audience. What are Canadians getting wrong about the reconciliation efforts? I'm going to ask each of you to speak to this, but stay with it, Tamara. I think um, people are looking at reconciliation as um, making friendships with Indigenous peoples, but it's, not, it's more than just a friendship. It's uh, a working relationship where you're brought to the same level. So I look at it as non-Indigenous people uh, feel like they're way up here, but you need to level out and be on the same playing field and uh, work together. Elijah, what would you say? What are Canadians getting wrong? about reconciliation? Well, that's a loaded question, and I feel like that is, a, that is a lecture series right there. But as an educator, and I think about this a lot in terms of reconciliation, what does it mean? What does it mean as individuals, as organizations? So I think in terms of, if you think of what are Canadians getting wrong, I don't even think they understand what reconciliation is, so how can you get something wrong that you don't understand? So I think we have to go back to Stepping back, looking at the truth, looking at why, wh how did we get to this point in history? And a lot of the history is still influencing what is happening today. I think the fact that we live with the Indian Act in 2019 says a lot about where we're at in terms of reconciliation. You just have to look at a Facebook post about indigenous issues and there's your metric of assessment on where Canadians are at in terms of reconciliation. You see the racism, discrimination, ignorance, and and I think often enough that we have to go back and try to understand why we need to reconcile. And, it's, and it, I think reconciliation is about a rebuilding of a relationship. It goes back to when we first signed the 2-0 Wampum, that treaty that talked about how we as indigenous people are going to travel in our canoe alongside Europeans in their boat, side by side on this river of life together from time immemorial. And that treaty was meant to last forever. So I think it's rebuilding that relationship. Those were peaceful times at the time because what that treaty essentially was doing at the time was asking the question, how are we going to live together mm -hmm. in this diverse land? How are we going to live in harmony together, work together, be constructive? So I think we have to look back at those original values that have influenced us to, even to this day of, in terms of equity and diversity and inclusion. So how do we get back to that? Um, that original relationship that started that I think what makes you know, us in a way better. So I think understanding that is the first step. Thank you. Gabrielle, what are Canadians getting wrong about reconciliation? So um, when we did the roadmap on uh, TRC 66, we actually heard from over 500 Indigenous youth across the country. So this is probably one of the biggest data collections uh, directly from Indigenous youth voices um, that was ever done. This is like a really huge research project. And at that time, 69% of Indigenous youth told us that they did not believe in reconciliation. So that tells you that Indigenous youth do not feel like Canadians are understanding <laughs> reconciliation at all. Um, and I would totally echo what Tamara and Elijah have just spoke about. Um, a lot of Canadians, uh, they start to create their own ideas of reconciliation in their heads without actually reading um, the work that has been done. So there's like the TRC calls to action. If you want to do reconciliation, refer to the calls of action. Don't make up a definition in your own head. Um, and also, we, we have to look at, at governments and policies and systemic racism that exists. It's not just about, you know, like, if I get along with this non-Indigenous person, reconciliation. That's not what this is about. It's creating equity. It's bringing us to the same playing field. Um, and we have a lot of work that we need to do within our communities, but we also need your support to get our communities in a, in a healthy and strong place. I'm going to stay with you for a moment, uh, Gabrielle, and ask you to fast forward 20 years. What kind of Canada do you want to see? What, what, how would you describe the Canada you're working to build 20 years from now? 
So in 20 years from now, I hope that I don't have to do this work. I hope that this work will already have been done, that young people will feel good about themselves, will be able to you know, not just focus on all the problems they see, but they'll be inventing, they'll be creating, they'll be revolutionizing um, and supporting all of us doing that work with that traditional knowledge. Um, in 20 years from now, I hope that I don't have to explain to someone who a Métis person from the settlements are. That's what I hope in 20 years. I was actually on the train here. So I took the train here yesterday and um, I overheard two people at the desk um, and they were talking about who are Métis people. And then they started uh, defining it themselves, two non-Indigenous people. And then one of them said, oh yeah, it's when an Indian person mixes with a white person. And I'm like, do I go over there and educate them? Or do I just get on the train? <laughs> but I hope in 20 years, that's, I don't have to be educating uh, people that work at the train or on the plane or at any services that I go to. Great answer, very concrete. I won't ask you if you went over there or if you just got on the train. <laughs> 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 Elijah, how, what do you want to see in this country 20 years from now? What are you trying to build? So what my traditional knowledge teaches me is that, and fundamentally what Indigenous knowledge, I think one of them is that to be the best you can be as a person. So what I would want to see is a Canada to be the best that it can be in 20 years. I think it calls upon each and every one of us in this country to be accountable for that, to be accountable to our leaders, but also, because I read a lot of policy, um, so the Auditor General's Office audits the government and gives recommendations on, are their programs and services effective, are they working, are they spending the right amount of money? So for me, in terms of a report card, I would want to see Canada actually implement those recommendations that the Auditor General um, advises the government to do because they are concrete. They talk about comprehensive uh, measurements. They talk about appropriate amounts of money that should be spent. But we fall short of that consistently over every government. So the late Michael Ferguson said that the state of Indigenous services for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit is beyond unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So I think if we do not follow any of those recommendations, that report card's just going to be worse and worse and worse. So I hope in 20 years that we actually see some real change happen for Indigenous people so that everyone has equal access to opportunities in this country, especially our younger people that are going to be the change makers in those communities. And I hope I also see a Canada that no longer defines who Indigenous people are. Because what was left out of my bio is that I'm also defined by the Indian Act as an Indigenous person. So Section 6 has the authority, through legislative authority, to define who's Indigenous and who's not Indigenous, and there's a whole list of criteria that they follow. So I hope in 20 years that the control is back in the communities of who is Indigenous and who's not. Thank you, Elijah. Tamara, what do you want to see in 20 years? What are you working to build in this country? So my answer is very specific to Inuit, but my hope is for all of Canadians, especially Indigenous peoples. But for Inuit, we have three, uh, four regions in Canada that encompass all of our Inuit, and there's about 65,000 of us. And I hope that uh, we don't have to define who we are and that we're distinct people with our own language and culture. And I hope that our young people don't have to turn to suicide because Inuit have the highest suicide rates in Canada, over 10 times more than other Canadians. And I hope that they feel empowered and I hope that they strive and they get to have to see their grandchildren grow up and, you know, live the best life that they can live. And that's, that includes um, being able to speak their language, being able to practice their culture go hunt a seal and not be ashamed for it. And um, I think Canada has a long way to go and it probably will be more than 20 years from now, but we'll get there. Thank you. All great, great wishes for the future. What, uh, I'm gonna ask each of you to have a last word, a last round. I've got lots of questions. 
will not get to them all. Some about what do you think about whitewashing juries and what does that do to truth and reconciliation? Mm. What's the most important quality a leader can have when serving Indigenous youth? What's the best advice you've ever gotten? I think I'm going to stop there. What's the best advice you've ever gotten? And there are a lot of Indigenous youth in this room today. What do you want to say to them? Tamara. OK. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so for my Indigenous youth and friends, it's going to be hard. You're going to struggle a lot, and you're going to be uh, have the feelings of defeat. But you, you need to understand that this is your land. This is where your ancestors have lived since time immemorial. This is your time to shine. And you take the time, and, and you practice self-care in your own way. And you live the best life that you can live. And you just keep going. Just keep doing it. Great advice. Gabrielle. <laughs> she threw us off, eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think the best advice I was ever given was always do things with integrity and always, always tell the truth. Um, and so I've, I've always tried my best to do that. And there's so many times where people around you will have their own agendas and want you to sway and, and support their agenda. But if it conflicts with your integrity and your truth, and, it, and if it conflicts with your ancestors and what they guide you to do, then don't do it. Just say no. Um, and I think that's, that's always been what I do. It's hard, though. It's not an easy <laughs> path to walk. Um, when, you, when, you, when you're strong, people notice it, and they want to take that strength away from you. Um, but take it as a compliment. When uh, people are trying to take something away from you, it means that you have something really good. Um, so yeah, just keep, keep going. And it's going to be a, a long, hard road, but it, it'll be worth it. And I think that the work that we do today We'll be able to see it in 20 years, in 30 years, in the next generations, and that'll all be worth it. And Elijah, what are your words of advice? For me, it's to be proud of your history. Be proud of where you come from. I think that's the most important thing you can do as an Indigenous youth, is to be proud of all of that. Be proud of the original teachings that you might have had as a kid or that you learned about. And if you don't, if you didn't have any of that, I would say be proud that you're here, that, you're, that you can have these connections and reach out as much as you can because I think the knowledge that we have as Indigenous people have grounded me in where I am today and where I want to be in the future. And, and I think it's just such an amazing time to be alive around this time because I think despite adversity, despite all of that, you can be resilient, you could um, be constructive, you can build on and also create a future for younger generations so that they can have opportunities just like we did and so that we can t continue to think of those seven generations that have yet to come. And I know that there are going to be some dark times, there are going to be rough times ahead, but I think when you're in those situations, always remember that the sun will always rise the next day. Thank you. Well, friends, with leaders like this, we are in good hands. I um, want to say to those of you here and those of you who are joining us by webcast, uh, get involved. There is a way to support greater leaders, greater leadership, like the ones you've heard from today. One of the myths that exists in Canada is that Indigenous youth have their education paid for from cradle to grave. Not true. There are some funds for some students for some level of education. And I think you can see from the three panelists we've heard from today, amazing role models all, the power of education and the leadership that is coming to the fore.
We're really proud and inspired to support students every year. Last year, more than $14 million, 4,900 students. And among those, 649 are in STEM, 601 educators, 452 business and commerce students, 391 nurses, and I could go on. This is the future of Indigenous communities. This is the future of Canada, and the future is bright. I want to say thank you very, very much, Gabrielle, Elijah, Tamara. We're <laughs> going to follow each one of you in your career paths, but they would be the first to tell you that they're not unique, that there are many other outstanding Indigenous leaders. And so thank you so much for spending time with us today. And, and I'll echo those thanks. Elijah, Gabrielle, and Tamara, on behalf of all of us at the Canadian Club, I want to thank you for sharing, sharing your stories of determination and, and resilience. You are eloquent, wise, and visionary way beyond your years. Elijah, I was so moved when you talked about how your culture pushed you through the door. And Tamara, you reminded us to step back and to look at the policies to ensure that young people can be strong and so they can shine. And Gabrielle, your roadmap for grassroots change and programming, ensuring that youth voices can be heard, was inspirational. And I hope we get to a point where you don't have to correct anybody at a train station <laughs> in the future. We have big wrongs to right in this country. We must embrace the true definition of reconciliation, the true meaning of reconciliation in the spirit of working together to create a new positive and productive relationship with Indigenous peoples. It's slow work, which we must commit to and build upon from a foundation of mutual respect and a clear-eyed understanding of our past in Canada. Our knowledge of and appreciation for the culture, talents, wisdoms, and learnings of our Indigenous people informs us all as Canadians. Building on what Roberta was saying last week, I happened to see a copy of the Giving Report. Uh, which is produced in partnership with Imagine Canada and Canada Helps. And the report looks at all the aggregate donations to charities. Um, and it was surprising and very disheartening to see that in 2018, of all the money donated to charities across Canada, only 1% was directed to Indigenous issues or charities serving Indigenous peoples. So we can and must do better. Um, there are opportunities to build meaningful partnerships founded on deep respect. I think we saw that here today, absolutely. Um, I want to close by thanking our moderator, a great advocate who also leads by example. Roberta, thank you for your lifetime of deep commitment to Indigenous peoples, for framing the issues, for showcasing the talent and this tremendous potential, and for embodying the spirit of hope for a better, more productive, more inclusive future. This is a great gift. It's your gift to all of Canadian, all Canadians, and it is formidable. So thank you. Um, so to all of you, it was a marvelous, marvelous uh, event, and uh, we're very grateful for you being here and sharing with us. And now, once again, I move from the sublime to the housekeeping. Um, I need to tell you about our upcoming events. On Thursday, April 4th, uh, we're going to have the Ontario Treasury Board President, the Honourable Peter, Peter Bethenthalvey, and he will be here to speak about the province's fiscal health in advance of the upcoming budget. And on April 10th, we'll be joined by Rebecca McKillian, um, CEO of Well.ca, and she's going to provide insights about the evolution of Canadian retail, and we hope you can all come again and, see with, and visit us. And thanks to MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space, and BBC for live streaming today's event. And thank you all for being here. We hope you'll come again. Mm -hmm.